Uh, first, good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to this first uh, session of the day. This session is uh, hosted by INRIA, uh, which is a National Research Institute for Computer Science uh, in France. And I am Daniel Lemetayer. I am a research uh, director at, uh, at INRIA. So I'm going to chair uh, this session, uh, which means uh, basically that I'm going to say a few words of uh, introduction. And the moderator will be um, Benjamin Nguyen, on my right. Uh, Benjamin is a professor of computer science at INSA, which is um, an engineering uh, school uh, in France. Uh, so um, the topic of this uh, panel is um, anonymity. Anonymity at the age of uh, big data and uh, open data. Uh, so we thought it was uh, a good time to have uh, a debate, a discussion on this topic at CPDP uh, because actually for many reasons. Uh, first, uh, as you know, uh, the stakes are high. Uh, more and more uh, organizations today uh, collect huge amounts of data uh, and they want to combine them, they want to exploit them, to analyze them, and the point, well, for sometimes it's for very good reasons. Sometimes it's for, uh, with, with very high benefits for, for society, for the economy. So it, it, it has to be done. But the point is that they can do it without bothering at all about personal data regulations if the data sets can be considered as anonymous. But what does it mean exactly to be anonymous and uh, how can this be established? Um, and is it even possible to consider that a data set which has been built, uh, which has been derived from personal data is ever really entirely, definitely anonymous? So there are different opinions about this and um, I think also different ways of looking at um, uh, anonymity across disciplines. So uh, to better understand these uh, issues, uh, we have invited in this panel um, distinguished uh, speakers with very different backgrounds. Um, a lawyer, uh, computer science, uh, statistics, and also the interpretation authority. Uh, so each of them will have about uh, 10 minutes to, to express his views. Uh, followed by a few minutes of questions from the audience, and uh, hopefully we will still have a few minutes for questions uh, at the end of the of the session. So, for the sake of time, I will I will stop here. I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Vincent Toubiana. Vincent is uh, an IT expert uh, at the CNIL, the French uh, Data Protection Authority. Um, so, Vincent has, has, uh, was was formerly a researcher at uh, Bell Labs and New York University. He worked um, in particular on, on track me not that you may have heard of. Um, and uh, more recently, Vincent has been involved in the, in, the, in the work of the Working Party 29 on anonymization. And uh, today, Vincent is going to tell us more about the recent opinion of the Working Party uh, on this topic. So Vincent, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. Um, can you hear me? Okay, sounds good. Um, so I will try to present the. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Wrong. I'll try to present the opinion on anonymization techniques that has been published by uh, Article 29 Working Party last year. Um, it's a 30 page document, um, and I have only about 10 minutes, so for the sake of time, I will be very quick on the technical parts. I will try to focus on why uh, Article 29 wrote this opinion and how it should be used by data controllers and uh, other uh, experts. Um, so when you look at um, data uh, from a data protection perspective, you see that uh, there is a dichotomy between personal data and anonymized data. So. Personal data are uh, all subject to data protection laws, whereas on the other side, anonymized data, for most of them, are not subject at all to data protection laws. 
and there is no intermediary state between uh, these two sets. Um, and for data protection authority, this is very critical because when we consider that a data set is anonymized, it means that we have no word to say about it anymore. Um, you can publish it, you can use it for any purpose, uh, you can use it for open data, make it public, and everyone can have access to it. So um, it, it becomes very critical for us to be able to assess that a data set is correctly anonymized and that it won't be possible to identify someone into the data set anymore. But for many data controllers, um, they consider that removing names, first names, last names, um, phone numbers, and other uh, personal identifying information uh, is actually enough to make a data set anonymous. Um, and that's something which we see very frequently. They de 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 uh, describe their anonymization techniques by just removing names. And that's actually what we call uh, pseudonymization. And we consider that um, for most data controllers, they see that pseudonymized data is actually uh, anonymized data. But um, over the last decades, we've seen many examples of uh, pseudonymized published data sets that has been uh, used and attacked by, um, by um, computer scientists to show that actually they were not anonymized. It was possible to identify people in these data sets. Um, the first example, um, I think it was in 2006, that AOL published the search logs of um, thousands of users. And uh, it was for some of them possible to identify the users which issues, issued uh, some queries. Um, in 2008, there was uh, the um, uh, Netflix price um, the anonymization attacks where uh, Narayan and Shmatikov showed that it was possible uh, to re-identify some of uh, Netflix users based on the reviews. And uh, even last year, um, there was an attack on um, a data set published um, of New York City taxi cabs. As it, the data set of all New York City taxicab strips for 2013, I guess, was published, uh, and it was just pseudonymized. So it, was shown, it, it has been shown that it was possible to identify some of the taxicab drivers, but it was also possible to uh, identify some of the passengers. So for example, you knew that someone uh, took a cab uh, on, a, on a street at a given time, and you were able to know from where to where he went with his, with his taxi. And so there, is, uh, there are example, uh, practical example where celebrities were uh, tracked based, uh, based on that. And so we, we show, it, it shows that uh, pseudonymizing a data set is not enough to actually uh, make it anonymous. And we are aware of all these examples, uh, AOL, Netflix, and uh, NYC taxi cab trips, just because they're public. So we can assume that uh, data controllers, when they use um, uh, that are set anonymized for further processing, we, we may assume that they're not taking so much uh, precaution. So we, we have to make sure that they consider that pseudonymized data are still personal data. Um, just a few words about the new regulation which in introduced the concept of pseudonymous data, uh, which, is a subset, which is still defined as a subset of personal data. Um, so uh, in the opinion, we don't really focus on that. We, we, just try to make the line, to, to define the line between personal data and uh, anonymized data. And this is a blurred line because it's not really easy to define the frontier between what is personal data and uh, what is anonymized data. And one of the key um, uh, objective of this opinion is actually to help data controllers to uh, find if the data set has been correctly anonymized. And to do that, uh, the opinion provides two options. Uh, the first option is to verify that uh, the anonymized data set has known of the following property. Um, first, it should not be possible to still single out uh, data records about an individual in the data set. So that's a, single, a singling out property. Uh, the linkability property uh, is that it should not be possible to actually uh, link data records <coughs> about an individual or a group of individuals in the data set. Uh, and so you should not be able to link uh, data records about an individual uh, in the same data set, but also between two different data sets. So if there is an obvious identifier that is used by in two different data sets, uh, you should remove this, this identifier to remove the uh, linkability property. 
Um, just to explain a little bit the difference between singling out and linkability. Uh, linkability is also about group of individuals and data subjects. So uh, if you're able to, um, to, to link uh, data records about group of individuals, then you still have a linkability property. But if you're not able to uh, single out someone in the group, then you don't have the single out property. So just to make uh, a, a quick distinction between these two ones. Uh, the third property is inference. Uh, it should not be possible to draw inferences about data subject based on, um, based on the anonymized data set. And uh, if uh, you're not able to show that your anonymized data set has known of the following property, then you have to uh, make an analysis of a re-identification risk. And so uh, once these properties are defined in uh, the opinion, then uh, the opinion try to see for all of, well, for most of the known anonymization techniques, um, what are the risks, what are the properties that they're able to handle. Um, and as you can see in the table, um, there is no known technique which actually remove all risk all the time. Uh, some of them will remove most of the risk, like for example, differential privacy. Uh, but um, there, normally you will have to combine, based on, the, on your data set, you will have to combine multiple techniques. Um, the opinion also tried to explain for each, for each of these techniques what are the drawbacks and what are the pitfalls, how to configure them and what are the key parameters uh, to play with to actually anonymize the data set. Um, since we are, we're also talking about big data, um, I will just to, I just wanted to have a few words about uh, the compatibility between uh, big data and the uh, uh, no inference property. Um, so the no inference property actually that we have in the, the anonymization uh, opinion is about data subjects. So you should not be able to make inference, to draw inferences about data subjects, but um, you sh could still draw inferences about objects or trends. Um, and so this, even the three criteria approach does not uh, prohibit uh, big data per se. The other solution is actually to um, use uh, this, the second option, which is re-identification risk analysis. Uh, and there is no uh, prohibition at all about inference in this second approach. So um, if you follow this uh, approach, uh, you can use big data uh, and there is no problem with inferences. Um, and then finally, um, the opinion provides some recommendations, some practical recommendations for, um, for data controllers of, uh, about how to anonymize uh, data sets. Um, first, prior to anonymization, um, you, should, um, you should specify your use of the data set. What is the utility that you want to remain in the data set even when it is anonymized? What, what's the purpose of the data set? Second, you should, based on that, you should be able to distinguish the key attributes of your data set. What are the values that you want to keep inside and what are the values that you may want to remove? Uh, it will help you to actually um, in, uh, anonymize the data set if you're able to know what are the values that are not necessary for, for the further processing. And also remove the identifiers and uh, singular values that uh, may be used to link data records uh, uh, between data sets. This, um, this will help to anonymize the data sets. Once you've done that, once you specify your use, and I think specifying the use of the anonymized data set is a key, key element here. Uh, once you've done that, you're able to find a tailored solution by combining different techniques. Um, and uh, you should also document your choice. So uh, explain what are the techniques you use, what are the parameters, and how you combine them. Um, assess the right identification risk, eventually, if this is the option you follow. And uh, afterwards, when you have anonymized your data sets, uh, you can eventually share the um, anonymization process that you followed so that uh, DPAs will be able to evaluate it. And also, you can share with the scientific community. Uh, your anonymization process to have it reviewed, and follow developments and evolutions of um, anony the anonymization attacks uh, to be aware of new techniques, but also to be aware of what are the data sets that are available right now that can be used to eventually identify your own data set.
Um, thank you. So the opinion is available here. I think it's maybe too small to read. Um, but um, so you can find the opinion uh, on Article 29 website. Um, if you have any question, um, uh, me and my colleague at Neil, uh, we, we could help. But also, since it's a joint work between all the DPAs, you can uh, contact your uh, uh, local DPAs to ask questions. Thank you, Masson. Uh, so, are there any questions in the audience on this topic? There's a microphone which is going to be brought to you. Coming back to your last slide, I'm, first of all, I'm um, Stefan Van I'm working at the Belgian Federal Healthcare uh, Center, Research Center, and I'm uh, involved with uh, healthcare data analysis. So, in removing infrequent values seems to be a good option from a juridical point of view, but from the healthcare research point of view, you shouldn't do it. So there is another axis you should consider is when does anonymization, but I mean pseudonymization, when and uh, small cell risk analysis with the consequences, when does it apply? Does it apply before research or does it apply on publication of research results and data? It's a very important uh, point uh, to consider. So um, I, I can imagine that for a health purpose, there is um, probably need to have the uh, uh, infrequent values in the remaining in the data sets. Um, but the thing is, if you, if you do that, then you cannot consider the data set to be truly anonymous. Um, well, in some cases, yes, and you will have to go through a re-identification risk analysis. But my, um, my opinion is that, um, as you said, there is two, two use of the data set. First, you can use it just for the research, and then it, it is not necessarily fully anonymous. Once it's published, uh, obviously it has to be anonymous. But I don't know what, are the, the, um, what is the legal basis for your research and how maybe you have, maybe you have consent. You, you don't have to really always consider that the data set has to be anonymized to be able to do your, the, the research. I'm not talking, it's about pseudonymization. Um, and of course you need to consider what do I need, what, what do I don't, but if you, Infrequent values apply to uh, uh, rare diseases and so So if you remove those elements in your data set, there is a lot of research that can be done. So you need, you need to consider pseudonymization and then uh, a legal uh, framework for health researchers, healthcare researchers, with a, com uh, uh, how should I say, um, clausel of uh, confidentiality and then impose them the rules to uh, to consider and to be followed considering uh, publication of results. My point is if you do healthcare research you need full data, full personal longitudinal data which are pseudonymized, which means indirect identification. Yeah, is not I, I think we can have a, maybe another debate on the uh, use of non-anonymized data within healthcare, maybe at the end if there are other people from healthcare. There was another question, I think, just in front, and then we can take it at the back if it's quite quick. Uh, hello, my name is Carmela Troncoso from Gradient in Spain. Uh, I would like to ask you to elaborate a bit more on what you consider risk analysis of re-identification. Um. So you can, if, if you can take your data sets and show that you remove, um, like, so I, I have not done one yet. I, I can truly uh, provide concrete examples of that. Uh, but uh, you can, if you can show that on your data set there is no value that, it can, well, that can be used to um, be linked to another data set. And um, 
So normally as a rate identification risk analysis is not the option that we recommend. We try to focus really on those three steps. So uh, that's something which is more specific to every, um, every data set you, that you will consider and that you will have to anonymize. So I, I'm not fully, fully aware of what are the, the risk analysis, uh, but we, um, um, if you do one, if, if you're not able to show actually that your data set has, the following, uh, has none of the following property, um, then you, you should probably even, <clears throat> so I, my, um, I guess that when you try to show that uh, your data has none of the following property, you will be able to uh, show that there is no linkability and um, potentially there is still possible to single out. And based on the risk of singling out someone, you can show that um, if, even if I can single out someone, what are the risks that I really build through uh, link that to its true identity? Um, so it's really, there is no general framework, uh, in my opinion, about uh, identification risk. It's something um, which is still, well, as, as we saw that there were many attacks for which, we con uh, which on data set we considered not to be um, <coughs> personal data, and we've seen that uh, afterwards it was still personal data. So there is, so far there is no real uh, fully effective identification um, risk analysis that has been published as far as I know, but um, maybe these are, um, but I'm not aware of all of them. Yeah, we'll take a last question or comment if it's quite quick, please. Yeah. Um, so I'm also from non-for-profit healthcare research sector, and um, to be honest, I'm pretty agreeing with you that the true, true anonymization nowadays probably doesn't exist anymore. Uh, with, with the modern techniques, it's, it's pretty possible unless the data are fully aggregated to identify at least part of it. My problem is elsewhere. Uh, my problem is precisely from the moment that we suppose that the data are not fully anonymized and that we take conditions of the data protection, current conditions, um, they are so strict and you gave a lot of examples of breaches and uh, they are all linked to a criminal activity. So basically what the current rules say to us, and I'm doing a parallel with the common life, that because we have pickpockets, we shouldn't go out with any pockets on us. And actually, we shouldn't go out at all. So indeed, the anonymization, full anonymization is very difficult, but maybe there is a way to have a risk-based approach. And for me, pseudonymous data is a very good example of it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I think this is uh, probably a, a point we can discuss at the end, uh, the place of uh, pseudonymized data. Uh, this was already um, a little bit explained by Vincent. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Vincent. Thanks for the questions. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Mark uh, Elliott, and Mark is one of the most active researchers in uh, anonymization uh, today, and he also has uh, an extensive experience in uh, collaborating with uh, non-academic partners, and, and in particular, uh, national statistical agencies. Uh, Mark is a co-director of the National Center for Research Methods and he also leads a UK anonymization network and today is going to tell us more about this um, anonymization network. Mark, the floor is yours. Okay, so yeah, I'm from uh, Manchester University. Um, I, this badge, uh, UCAN, is the UK anonymization network and I will say a bit more about that but the framing of my talk is to describe what we call the anonymization decision-making framework, which has been developed by AL Network. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly say who we are uh, and what we think anonymization is. Uh, we have some differences of opinion to those expressed in the Working Party 29 opinion. Uh, the and then I'll go on to describe the anonymization decision-making framework. Okay, so you can. So our primary aim is to provide advice and guidance to any organization that wants to share data and needs to anonymize it in order to do so. By sharing, we mean sharing with one other party all the way through to publishing. And uh, there's several goals um, which were critical to this. Uh, central one is to think about and establish mutual understandings of differences in perspective on anonymization across sectors, disciplines, 
uh, and components. So there are lots of different views on what anonymization is. There's a critical uh, difference between legal understandings and technical understandings and harmonization of those, as I think came out in the questions to the previous speaker, is quite a critical uh, uh, way of within which we need to move forward. Um, so we've uh, attempted to synthesize the key concepts underlying those differences of opinion into a common framework, which is our anonymization decision-making framework, agree best practice principles, and set up a set of services to provide people with advice on anonymization in different forms. Uh, we have four tier structure, hub operations, that's Manchester. Uh, we have a, a set of partners who I'll describe in the moment, uh, a core network of 30 partners uh, who uh, set strategy for the network, and then there's a community of, of users uh, in the UK and indeed now beyond. Uh, so these are the partners, it's the Information Commissioners uh, in, in the UK, the Office of National Statistics, Open Data Institute, and, and two universities. Um, so it's quite a difference of perspectives in, even amongst the partners. We have the regulator, we have a, uh, the major supplier of data in the UK, uh, and indeed a voice for uh, opening up data. Uh, the core network has representatives from uh, sectors across the UK, uh, academia, government, commercial sector, and, and indeed the third sector in NHS as well. Uh, so we have a range of services that we've already developed. We run clinics. We're running a, a, a whole set of them through this spring. Uh, we will do consultancy services, uh, uh, increasing community engagement. Uh, and we're looking in the next uh, 12 months to set up an accreditation system for accrediting uh, professionals uh, as anonymization professionals. Okay, so what is anonymization in our framework? The first thing to say is anonymization is a process. It's not a state. Okay, so it's a process by which personal data are rendered non-personal. It's quite a complex process. The thing to kick into touch, anonymization gets used in multiple different ways. Uh, four I want to mention here, um, absolute anonymization. Okay, so the last uh, questioner referred to this. This is a zero possibility of re-identification under any circumstances. That's his straw person number one. This is not a possibility. If you want to have usable data, I agree with Paul Ohm here, if you want to have usable data, you can't have data that's absolutely anonymized. Formal anonymization uh, is de-identification, including pseudonymization. This, uh, as the previous speaker indicated, is very rarely sufficient. Okay? It's rarely, rarely sufficient on its own. However, there's a caveat on that which I'll come to later. Statistical anonymization, uh, or statistical disclosure control, as it, as it often is called, is a technical process which is very focused on data. And the fourth of these, which is the one we use, is called functional anonymization. Now, functional anonymization, as we'll see in a moment, takes into account the context of the data, and that is really important if we're going to have a usable form of anonymization as we move forward into the big data era. So the notion is that there's a negligible risk of re-identification given the data situation. Okay, so we're not at the point where we are trying to achieve zero risk. Okay, so now just to cover the point about anonymization and de-identification, which includes pseudonymization. Um, there's a critical point in the DPA and indeed in other instantiations of the, of the uh, Data Protection Directive. Um, is that this split between individual who can be identified from those data or from those data and other data. Okay, that's a split in the definition. Pseudonymization and other forms of de-identification deal with that first of those. Okay, it stops you being able to re-identify the individual from those data, and that is all it does. Okay, so in order to deal with the other part of it, which is from those data or a, a, other data that might come into possession of the data controller, et cetera, um, you, need to, you need more. And the, and the more that you need is functional anonymization. Okay, so these are some tenets of functional anonymization, and I'm just going to refer to it as anonymization now because it's the only functional process. It's not just about the data. It's about data situations. And data situations arise from data interacting with data environments, okay? the environment in which the data sits. It's impossible to determine whether a data is anonymized or not, and therefore personal or not, without reference to that data's environment. And some of this does appear in the Working Party opinion when they talk about having to take account of a wide range of data. The data that you need to take account of in that other data available to the data controller critically depends on the data situation. 
So data environments, that part of the data situation, data plus environment, is a set of formal processes, structures, processes, mechanisms and agents that either act on the data, provide context, interpretable context for those data, and define and control and interact with the data. It's all the processes operating around the data. So typically we consider security infrastructure, governance, agents, and other data when we're thinking about that in a practical sense. Okay, so this leads us on to the framework. So what is the anonymization decision-making framework? It's a, it's a system for developing anonymization policy. Within an organization, you can use this to develop anonymization policy for your organization. It's also a practical tool for understanding your data situation. It's not, I stress, a checklist, even though there's, there's a series of steps uh, in, a, in the slide after this one. The responsibility, if you're carrying out uh, anonymization in a responsible fashion, you need to have, go through three essential processes. Understand how a privacy breach might occur. Okay? And that, for example, in the examples that we were given earlier on with open data from a AOL and the New York Taxi example, were examples of situations where the data controller did not even do step one. They did not consider how a privacy breach might occur. And then understand the consequences of that breach, how important it is. Sensitivity is important in considering the utility, the disutility side of the risk, which we very rarely consider uh, in anonymization. And then reduce the risk of the breach occurring to a negligible level, down to the level which we can ignore it. Okay, now I won't go through the details of this, but this is the 10-step process. Now, we go through this process when we're providing consultancy to an organization that wants to anonymize its data. And there's a lot in here. It's not just about the technical process. Okay, so it's also about the use case. What is the data going to be used for? That's the important point to start from. Until you know that use case, you won't know what data is actually needed for a particular share. Uh, the legal issues are very important. Consent, how, what's the consent processes? These can be quite complicated. Who has provided consent and consent for what? Uh, know the processes then that you'll need to go through technically in, ter in terms of understanding the risk, actually doing the, the, the uh, assessment of the uh, risk of re-identification. That should be re-identification on number five. Uh, and know the processes you know then need to go through to anonymize your data. That's the technical process. To do that, you'll need to understand the environment. And critically, through all those processes, what other data could be brought to bear in that situation in order to re-identify the data, which is a practical tool. Uh, and then the things afterwards, okay? So you need to communicate with your audience. So you might want to, in some circumstances, publish your anonymization techniques. That is not always a wise thing to do. If you publish your anonymization technique, you may be increasing the risk of re-identification because you'll be providing information from attacker about how it's been specified. Sometimes you don't want to do that. Know what to do if things go wrong. So occasionally, since we are not operating on a zero risk uh, uh, situation, we have to entertain the possibility that despite all our best efforts, uh, a breach will still occur. You need to have a breach policy in place. And, and then what happens next once you've shared the data? Okay, so this is not a, uh, a release and forget approach. Okay, you need to be constantly evaluating the situation. And you may need to withdraw data from the share if other information comes to light or, th or the environment changes. Okay, so the anonymization decision-making framework is a tool that allows you to think constructively about your uh, data situation. It moves us closer to a harmonized idea of anonymization. Uh, and just to plug at the end here, there will be an open source book uh, forthcoming uh, available on the UCAN website. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We just have the time for one quick question. Front row. Hello, my name is uh, Maria de Bonthuis. <laughs> very nice talk, thank you very much. Um, you said in the beginning that there was a difference between the legal and the technical um, interpretation. Um, where do you think that difference is and what should we do about it? Okay, I, I, the, the critical point is uh, the notion of risk. Um, so legal definition uh, it very much is a, a, a binary concept. Okay, you, Either something is anonymized or it is not. Either something is personal or it is not. How do we tie that in to a notion of risk which is inherently statistical and based on probability? Uh, and that's where 
the, the discussion has been. This is where we come up with this notion of negligibility, where the risk has got so small that we effectively consider it to be zero, even though we know it is not actually zero. Thank you. Thanks. I saw there was a question over there. We'll try to keep it for, for later on because we're running a bit late. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Mark. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Josep Domingo Ferrer. Josep is a professor of computer science at the University of uh, Tarragona in, in Catalonia, where I hold the UNESCO chair in data privacy. Um, Josep's uh, research interests are, are quite varied. They include uh, uh, privacy, data security, uh, statistical disclosure control, cryptography, and uh, he has a strong focus on the conciliation of privacy, security, and, and functionality. And I think uh, Josep is going to talk to us about uh, his conciliation in the context of anonymization today. Josep, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. And good morning to everyone. <clears throat> so I'll try to uh, carry on uh, with uh, discussing anonymization. But I will point out that some of the downsides that current methods have uh, namely uh, concerning subjects, uh, users, and also the, the intruders. Um, so let's just recall that uh, what anonymization is. Uh, we have an, uh, an original data set, which we can call X, um, in which each record carries the attribute values of a subject. Then there is a data protector, also called data controller, which, uh, who anonymized, anonymizes this X uh, by masking or, or modifying the, the data, or sometimes by generating uh, synthetic data with similar statistical properties. And let's call the anonymized data uh, set Y. Then users, um, when they uh, get data, they get Y. So they perform analysis on, on Y, and they expect to get results uh, on Y that are, that are similar to those that would be obtained on the original data set uh, X. This is called data utility of the anonymized data. Then there is also uh, an intruder who may attempt disclosure attacks. Uh, ne what, what is called uh, identity disclosure or attribute disclosure. Uh, identity disclosure uh, occurs when a record in the anonymized data set uh, Y can be linked with the subject's identity. So if we can uh, find out that this record belongs to that subject, there is identity disclosure. Then there is another type of disclosure which is called attribute disclosure and uh, it occurs when the value of a confidential attribute uh, of a certain subject, like for example uh, diagnosis in a healthcare data set, can be determined uh, more accurately with access to the anonymized data than without. Um, so one type of disclosure does not imply the other, uh, and, and that's, that's, well, but both of them are dangerous. Um, when anonymizing data, the data protector uh, can follow two different approaches. Uh, one of them is called utility first, and this is the approach usually followed by national statistical institutes, and the, the approach more used in practice, I must say, uh, which consists of first anonymizing the, the data, the original data, so that the utility is reasonably preserved uh, in the anonymized data, and then check whether the anonymized data are sufficiently protective. That is, if disclosure risk is uh, low enough. If disclosure risk is not low enough, then the data should be anonymized again with stronger distortion until the risk is uh, acceptably low. So this is the practical, well, the, the approach that is used 90%, 95% of the time. But then there is another approach which is very much liked by the academics in, in which I, I am, uh, well, in which, uh, well, I, I, well, actually, like myself, actually, but, but I must say that uh, it is not used uh, very often. And this is the privacy uh, first approach. Um, in this case, one uses a privacy model like anonymity or differential privacy, etc., that guarantees uh, a priori a target privacy level, uh, but there is no regard to utility. So the data are very safe because they, uh, well, have been anonymized by conforming to a, a prescribed privacy model. But then the utility is not taken care of. Um, so. Um, what, is the, the sh what are the shortcomings of doing these things in this way? Uh, well, there is a, a first shortcoming related to subjects, and this is verifiability. Uh, current anonymization does not favors, favor the subject's informational self-determination. Uh, I mean, if I give my data um, for it to be included in a record that has to be anonymized, then as a subject, I have no idea 
uh, whether my record has been protected enough or not. Um, so normally the data release or protector takes legal responsibility for the release and makes all choices, like the anonymization method, the parameters, the privacy and utility levels, etc. And the subject cannot verify whether she's getting adequate protection. So this is one first uh, shortcoming. There is um, another shortcoming related to, to intruders, which uh, mm, relates to the background knowledge that is assumed on, on the intruder side. In utility first and in privacy, privacy first um, uh, approaches, when based, for example, on the k-anonymity family, uh, when, if we take in privacy first the k-anonymity model, uh, one makes restrictive assumptions on the intruder's background knowledge. One, specifically, one assumes that the intruder only knows a subset of the attributes, which are called key attributes. Uh, in uh, differential privacy, if we follow the privacy first approach and use pri differential privacy as the model, there are no restrictive assumptions made, but uh, enough perturbation is needed to make the presence or absence of any particular record uh, unnoticeable in the anonymized data. So uh, anonymizing data such that the presence or absence of any particular uh, record is uh, not to be noticed requires a lot of noise. And therefore, utility is badly damaged if we follow this uh, differential privacy approach. Um, so, I mean, we cannot have uh, everything. Either we make uh, restrictive assumptions on the, uh, on the intruder or we lose a lot of utility. And there is a third uh, shortcoming based uh, related to, to the users, which is transparency. Um, the users are the ones who want to carry analysis on the anonymized data. How much detail shall or can be given to the user on the data masking methods and parameters used to anonymize a data release? Uh, of course, if the user was told about the methods used, uh, the user could make much more of the data, of the anonymized data. So the user could derive much more inferential utility um, from the data uh, it gets. But some methods, uh, some anonymization methods may be vulnerable if too much detail is given on their parameters or, or even uh, on their nature. So there are, as we see, three kinds of, 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 of shortcomings, verifiability, then assumptions on the intruder, and then transparency for users. Uh, we have proposed very recently, in fact this year, um, well, the, a paradigm based on, on permutation. Um, in this case, uh, what, we, what, what, what we show is that, in fact, any anonymization method can be um, regarded as a permutation plus some residual noise addition. And, uh, well, we introduce uh, a new privacy model here, and uh, we, uh, in fact, the, the reference is down here uh, in the slide, so we get rid of some of the problems that we have mentioned before. So the user can verify the protection that is being provided to her. The intruder, there, there, there are no assumptions that need to be made on the intruder's knowledge. And the user can be told nearly everything about the anonymization method being, being used, except the random seeds. Um, well, this, it is necessary to, to, to make progress in, in satisfying uh, subjects, uh, especially subjects, because they are the, the source of data. Because if we, don't, if we don't care about subjects, then um, um, it might happen that uh, subjects take peer-to-peer -peer solutions or they take uh, the position of not answering at all. Um, one option that subjects have, for example, is what we call co-privacy or co-utility, in which, uh, for example, the subject, subjects could exchange their answers, maybe over several hops, in order to protect their privacy before answering a survey. So I don't answer myself, I give my answer, my answer to someone else who forwards this answer to someone else, and then maybe that third hop guy will answer instead of, instead of me, and, uh, and conversely. So since uh, data collectors do not wish subjects to take their own privacy measures, they should take care of addressing the shortcomings uh, related to, to subjects, like verifiability. They should convince subjects that their data are protected enough. And uh, I guess that, that this is, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. So we have the time for one question in the audience. No? Okay, well then, we'll keep the other questions for the, for the end. Okay, thanks uh, very much, uh, Josep. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our next and last uh, speaker, Antoinette Rouvroy 
Antoinette is a FNRS uh, research uh, associate. So FNRS is a national fund for scientific research here in, in Belgium. And uh, she's also a member of the CREEDS uh, lab in, in Namur. Uh, Antoinette has many research uh, interests, and especially uh, multidisciplinary uh, research around the legal, ethical, and political challenges raised by new technologies. Um, I think that uh, Antoinette is going to bring us a legal and philosoph philosophical view of uh, anonymity here to this panel. Antoinette, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, wh what I, I will try to do is very tentative because uh, I am not a specialist of anonymity uh, at all and I'm very impressed by all that I have heard here. Um, but wh what I would like to do is, is to suggest that there may be a tension between the goals of anonymization or the practices of anonymization on the one hand, which at face value appear completely positive, anonymization is good, Huh? At face value, I would like to, to question that idea that anonymization is always good uh, by showing that there, there are tensions between anonymization and equal concern for people and non-discrimination on the one hand, and between anonymization and accountability on the other hand. And I, I will try to, um, uh, to, to give some examples of this, uh, of course, because uh, without examples, this will be not just not communicable. Um, in the title of this panel, there was big data. And in an era of big data, the big uh, issues are less identification or attribution of attitudes and, and, and behaviors to, to singular, singled out uh, individuals than uh, automated social sorting. Well, this is a, this is a hypothesis, huh? but th th this, this is the one from which I, I, I depart. So the, the big problem in big data is automated sorting. Uh, the, uh, the platforms have, uh, have, have a role of, of uh, gatekeepers. Uh, imagine, uh, as an example, that um, the, the mere act by a platform uh, of designing someone as uh, certain to repay a loan makes the likelihood of repaying uh, higher because people who have been ranked as good repayers of loan will easily get more loans in order to cover their, their, their possible difficulties to pay a loan. So, you, th th in fact, uh, um, categorization, algorithmic categorizations that, that are rendered possible thanks to big data allow for new kinds of social sorting which are, um, in a way, equivalent to um, Allo allowing rewards and punishments. So it, it's in, in that uh, context that I want to situate uh, my speech here. Um, so, uh, of course, I'm not against anonymization by, by, by default. Huh? But what I want to do is, is a bit like a devil's advocate instead of showing some, some possible problems. Uh, I, I, I'm not uh, of the opinion that uh, because anonymization, complete anonymization is never possible anyway, that every data should always be considered as personal data and should submit to the whole burden or to the burden of, 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 of respecting all the data protection uh, legal regime. Uh, this would be completely counter, uh, uh, counterproductive as, uh, uh, well, it would be unmanageable huh, uh, for data protection authorities, but also for data prof protection officers and for, for everybody, basically. And uh, it would also discourage any effort at anonymization, whereas anonymization, of course, produces uh, also positive impact. Uh, but no, what I want to... Mm, uh, to, to address is, uh, well, my first question. Um, we have the uh, underlying data that anonymization allows for more objectivity in the decisions taken against individuals or for individuals. Huh? The idea, uh, the underlying idea is that when, uh, uh, when we are anonymous, we will not be discriminated against for reasons uh, uh, which are not from our own, our own, our own responsibility in a way. Uh, because uh, the notion of, of uh, discrimination is this. Huh? Discrimination is, uh, it refers to the unfair or unequal treatment of people based on membership to a category 
or a minority without regard to individual merits. So uh, the first question I have then is, uh, is this one. Is anonymization a guarantee against, uh, uh, a guarantee first that everybody be, will be taken into account on the, the same equal level, equal, the, it's the notion of equal concern. And I, I, what I want to, 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 to say, just I will be quick, is that efforts of anonymization and aggregation may lead to small groups being omitted from the data. Imagine some, uh, some groups of uh, 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 people affected with rare medical conditions in a local area. In order to, to, to make these people anonymous, uh, you have just to, 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 dis, dis, to, to hide them from uh, the, data, the data set. Uh, and as anonymization is made in order to, 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 to share the data sets, it's, it will mean then that these people disappear uh, or become invisibly, in, invisible in, in policy discussions based on the data. So that's a first, uh, first uh, issue maybe or a first uh, uh, tension. Uh, in, in relating to the production of anonymity, uh, anonymity friendly data sets. Uh, a second issue, uh, a second question that I want to, to raise here, and I don't have, a, I don't have a, a, a clear answer, is whether really mm, anonymization as such is a guarantee of objectivity or more fa fair, fair treatment. There has been a, a study in 2011 in France about anonymization of CVs and the impact of anonymization of CVs on decisions of employment and, discri and on, uh, on discriminations against minority groups, ethnic groups, or gender discrimination. And the findings were quite su surprising. The effect of anonymization was that uh, when w uh, that uh, um, uh, um, people who have been anonymized uh, have been sometimes more discriminated than the ones who have not been anonymized. Uh, the, the results were quite uh, strange. Anonymization had a positive uh, impact on uh, gender discrimination for the reason probably that people like hiring people who resembles them. So usually male employers would very rarely um, uh, 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 hire uh, women employees. But when the gender is hidden, then it's complete, it's, the, the reverse happens. So uh, it's the contrary. More women have been engaged, uh, hired, uh, when their CVs were anonymized than men. Uh, but uh, uh, with, with regard to, to uh, race discrimination or ethnic origin, uh, or discrimination based on ethnic origin, it was com the, the reverse. In fact, people, uh, pe people emerging from immigration uh, had much less chance of uh, getting an interview when their CV was anonymized than otherwise. Why was that? Just because uh, knowing that a person comes from immigration allows, for the, the, um, allows the employer to, to correct some ideas, some basic ideas he has from the, from the CV and from possible gaps in the CV. Uh, when you know that someone is an immigrant, you can understand maybe the reason why he hadn't been able to work for two years, for example, because he had to move, and etc. You see? So it's not always the case that being anonymous is, is an advantage on, uh, uh, in, in the context of, uh, uh, well, for the, for the goal of e equality. Um, well, that's for direct discrimination, discriminations based on, uh, so, uh, uh, on explicit uh, belonging to specific groups. But uh, my question now is this one. How does anonymization impact on the discrimination bias contained in the original data sets? That's a kind of indirect discrimination. Um, in fact, that original data sets may be full of uh, uh, of biases. For example, I, uh, again, in employment context, you can have, a, 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 well, data sets uh, um, uh, 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 composed of records of uh, the duration of employment of different kinds of people. 
Hmm? But if you are in a society where racism exists or, 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 or um, things like that, uh, biases exist, of course the decisions of employers to, to keep or to fire people will be, uh, will be impacted by their own racism. So this is reflected in the data sets. But when you anonymize all these data sets, it, it will become quite difficult to, uh, to, to, to render this visible, the, the, the fact that uh, the models you will be creating on the basis of these anonymized data sets in fact reflect the, 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 the biases of, uh, the, the internal, of, the, of the original data set. How, so how, the, the question is then how to produce discrimination-free data models from original data sets which are which are uh, uh, containing <laughs> biases. Uh, one, uh, one solution, of course, is to measure discrimination in the original data set itself, which is quite difficult. Huh? And then to transform data has to clean the data set from discriminatory biases. Uh, but this is, uh, this is quite complicated, and it's even complicated by the law, because uh, copy copyright protections apply on original selection Collections and arrangements of data sets, so it's not it's not so easy to access. Uh, a second uh, solution, maybe, uh, would rather be to audit the algorithms that are used to produce models from these data sets in order to, to assess whether they they further uh, 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 um, increase the problem of, of, of biases or whether it's it solves it, but. Again, it's quite it's quite difficult because, uh, um, uh, in in fact, uh, these algorithms are, are not very transparent. Huh? Uh, uh, before they, they well, they are not only protected by IP law, huh? which uh, I, in IP law, IP law in fact uh, obliges some publicity, but IP law usually is not what is most used here. Uh, secrecy and trade secrecy. Is, is another way of protecting algorithms and trade secrecy uh, disallow any, com uh, any disclosure of, of algorithms, so it's quite difficult. Um, so, um, <coughs> it, um, the, the question uh, th then is uh, uh, how, how, how to manage th th this question of uh, indirect discrimination or direct discrimination or the question of equal concern. I think, of course, anonymization will not be the solution. It's the solution to other problems, but not to these problems. So uh, the, 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 the others, well, it's not a solution, but it's a way to go probably, is not to consider that anonymization is uh, an extinction is an, an extinction of accountability. Because that's the case for the moment. Anonymization plays the role of switching off uh, legal protection provided by data protection uh, legal regime and also a specific, um, a, a, a specific uh, 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 protections or uh, well, uh, specific accountability uh, clauses, such as the one which uh, concerns decisions taken on the basis of autom automatic processing uh, of, of data. So I think accountability should um, then be considered as, auto as autonomy, autonomous from data protection uh, legal regime, as a general one. Um, and by accountability, I, 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 I mean uh, uh, justification, the, obliga the obligation to justify, to justify what? To justify the factors that negatively affect rankings and sorting of people. So the, this principle of plain, unambiguous explanation should be applicable even when data which have been used to, to build the profiles and models have been completely anonymous and anonymized, uh, even if, if that was if ever possible, of course. So this principle, these principles should be applicable also for processing of anonymized data. Um, uh, uh, well, and, and I, I think that's, that's the way to go.
Um, but what does that mean in practice, accountability? Accountability of who against whom? Because if you are completely anonymous, if you are uh, if you are completely anonymous, anonymization appears uh, opposite to accountability because you always give account to someone. But when there is some n no one identifiable, you don't give account to anyone. So that, that's a uh, that, that's a contradiction. Then uh, uh, to conclude, uh, I, I would say that um, uh, it's a question of. <laughs> Being able, when you are categorized, uh, even anonymously, uh, to, 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 to ask the user uh, who has used data mining techniques to provide you with the logic, with the, the logic behind, which is not always uh, uh, easy, but also uh, to impose him the, the, the burden of proof that his system is discrimination free. Um, because the individual is unable to prove that, of course. So thank you very much. Thank you, Antoinette. So, are there any questions in the audience? I oh, should have wanted to have a... Yeah, um, this is uh, precisely on the issue of uh, combining uh, privacy protection uh, and anti-discrimination protection. Antoinette is perfectly right that uh, anonymization per se does not guarantee anti-discrimination because uh, normally, for example, in K-anonymity, what you do is to cluster together similar individuals. So if you cluster together the less favored people, they still are less favored uh, after anonymization. Uh, but there are techniques. We have uh, done research together with PISA, people at the University of Pisa, which has been published last year, on how to combine anonymization and, and anti-discrimination without uh, while taking, taking um, without causing twice as much distortion to the data. So the distortion you use to uh, protect privacy by anonymizing can also be leveraged to protect uh, against uh, discrimination. And you get data sets that are protected against both uh, kinds of threats, identification and discrimination. And this is quite feasible, and uh, both with k-anonymity and differential privacy and other methods. Thank you for the interesting remark. Are there any questions in the audience on discrimination or maybe on the putting burden of proof of non-discrimination on the entity which is processing the data? Okay, so if not, we're going to move to uh, more general questions to the, um, to the panelists. And uh, I'd like to give the microphone to the gentleman who kindly uh, wanted to speak earlier on, who was at the back of the room. Thank you for waiting. Was it, uh, yes, just next to you. I think you had a question you wanted to tell, um, to ask, sorry, uh, Mark Elliott earlier on, no? Oh, he's gone, <laughs> okay. Um, right, so Daniel wanted to, to. Yes, if I can abuse my, my role of, of chair, I would like to ask a quick question to the computer scientist on my left. I've heard uh, several times the uh, expression risk analysis, which I think also is a key, uh, is a key uh, factor, is a key step in, in, in all this process. But uh, so I've read a lot of things about privacy impact assessment, um, methods for risk analysis, but I still see quite a gap between all these and uh, anonymization. So and what's the state of the art uh, on, on this matter? Are there, to, you, to your knowledge, um, already available or work ongoing on risk analysis for anonymization or against the risks of de-anonymization? Um, I, I think that's small stati statistical research, and but I'm aware of, I, I, I think in 2011, 2013, um, a uh, paper about uh, risk analysis for health conditions uh, and anonymized data set. I think it was brought uh, by Fraled el um, And so I'm not aware of a general framework for risk analysis in, uh, with regard to anonymization. Um, but for specific cases, you can find uh, papers about some data sets where they consider um, 
um, such as the original data set and also uh, available auxiliary information and consider different type of adversaries, uh, whether data controllers itself or uh, some acquaintance of uh, the data subjects that may have auxiliary and personal information about the data subjects that can be used to identify. Um, and so that's the kind of risk analysis and more right off. Well, there are, uh, as, as I said in my presentation, there are approaches to anonymization which try to um, avoid the need for risk analysis by guaranteeing some privacy a priori, um, like, well, K anonymity, which ensures that uh, the risk of identification is at most one over K, uh, or differential privacy, which gives uh, more uh, <laughs> difficult to, to grasp a guarantee. But, but uh, it's true that the risk analysis remains uh, necessary even if you use a, a privacy model and it normally uh, is performed using record linkage experiments. So you assume that the intruder knows some of the attributes in the anonymized data set um, and then, uh, well, he knows these attributes uh, in an external database with identifiers and then the intruder tries, like for example, the electoral role. You have the electoral role, you have the names of voters, you have the address, you have more or less the age. Well, this uh, kind of external identified database can be used in an experiment of record linkage to try to identify the names in the role, well, to match them with records in the anonymized data. And if you succeed in identifying anonymized records uh, to a large percent or to a substantial percent, then uh, the risk is too high. And then you must identif uh, anonymize uh, in a harsher way <laughs> in order to prevent uh, those re-identifications. But it is something that must be carried out uh, before release by the data protector. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's on, it's on, okay. Okay, sorry. Well, so, sorry, hang on. We, I, first of all, um, Go ahead, Mark, sorry. We, I hadn't okay, seen Mark on, wanted go, just go. to finish on this. It's fine, I, I, go, go out to the audience, it's fine. You sure? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, sorry, please, sir. Well, uh, in my function, I pretty much appreciated the Manchester, uh, UK, uh, Manchester uh, representation because the, the steps he, he enumerated represent exactly the kind of responsibilities and job I do at my organization. So risk analysis is one of the major aspects in our debates with the Belgian Privacy Committee on getting access to data. And risk analysis you can do it in two ways. You can do it in a form of statistical way, which is just dimensional. And in healthcare data, you always end up with almost 100% small cells. So it's not a good issue. I always try to, to uh, uh, promote what I call logical uh, risk assessment, uh, which in fact, comes to what uh, the Manchester uh, UK uh, representation said. You need to do it in a functional, logical way. And it can't be done by pure statisticians. You, it has to be done by people. Do I stop? No, we've still got five minutes. Okay. I think I said the most important thing. Uh, okay, so I can answer both questions at once. Um, yeah, so risk analysis for us is, is indeed not simply statistical. The statistical component is actually important, but it's certainly not the, the most important part. There, there are several parts which are all equally important. For example, one of our uh, first steps in doing risk analysis is scenario analysis. Okay, so we develop principles by which we can understand data situations and where the privacy threats are. We define those and then they become either attack or in accidental release, uh, accidental disclosure models. And then we assess the risk of those. Um, and that's important because the risk is not just inherent in the data. Uh, and the statistical models tend to, not exclusively, they tend to focus solely on the data. Uh, and that's only hard. It's like trying to measure the sound of one hand clapping. It, it's not, not a full answer. The second problem with those models is that they are, they're not mature risk models. They're, they're risk models which just consider the probability of an event. They do not consider the disutility. 
uh, so standard risk models, we look at just the, not just the likelihood that something's going to happen, but what is it that's going to happen and how bad is that? What are the consequences of that? Because some privacy breaches are less consequential than others. So a mature risk model takes account of the, those factors as well. And the technical part of the anonymization framework does not cover that on its own. You need other things. So some of what we do is, is more like criminology uh, than either statistics or computer science. Thank you. Question in the front or middle of the room? Hi, thank you. It's uh, Tim Edgar from Brown University. Uh, my question really goes to this issue of risk and whether you can define an acceptable threshold of risk. And, you know, we've, we've been talking about this for a while, and none of you have really said this is what that level is. And I don't necessarily mean, oh, there's a 10% risk or a 5% risk or a 1% risk. But can any of you describe kind of what you think is the acceptable threshold of risk and then related to that, which I think is what makes it so difficult, is that um, depending on what analysis framework you've used and whether you've done it correctly, uh, it seems to me one of the biggest problems is that, is that you can make a mistake about the factors um, that Mark identified, and, and you may think that your risk is, say, 2% or 3%, even if you're just giving an estimate, when it's really 90%, because you didn't take account of the fact that um, you know, there's a data set that's publicly available that is very easy to link to this data set. You just weren't aware of the existence of that data set. It seems to me that the sort of the risk of getting it wrong is extremely high. Uh, even if when you do a, a perfectly valid analysis in good faith, you may end up with a risk that seems acceptable to you. And, and that seems to me to be the biggest problem in, in anonymization because it, given those two factors, you kind of end up in a world in which you can never anonymize data. And if you can never anonymize data, why are we even having this discussion? We just, just treat all data as, as being, as being uh, personal because we know that it's impossible. Uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of my dilemma. I wonder, you know, is that analysis just too pessimistic? And if so, am I missing something? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting question, basically. Uh, lots of data is available out there. I mean, there's going to be more, more open data. Uh, can the person who's anonymizing actually be aware of all the information which is, which is out there? So how can we deal against this? Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, it's not about setting thresholds. That's the first point to make. The, the sensitivity of the data that, that we're talking about is very important. So my, my genomics data at one end of the scale and say a data set which said where I lived and what car I drive at the other end of the scale. Now, I wouldn't care if somebody knew, found out what car I drove, because that's sort of visible information. Okay, so that, that's, that's a kind of a, an extreme center. Now, the point is, the error that you're talking about, absolutely true, there's always a possibility of error. How important is that error? It then becomes an issue of what sort of sensitivities do you have in this data? Is this, is this a data set where I really have to be as sure as I possibly can be? So there's a range of things that you can do uh, if you're in a, that high sensitivity situation. So we carry out, for example, penetration tests. So we draw information from, uh, from, from the data environment um, and we use that data to attack data sets. Uh, so we do that on behalf of clients. So in, in a situation where there's some sensitive data which is wanting to be released or shared in some way or other, there are mechanisms where you can reduce the, the, the range of error. Okay, so it's just like reducing the error in any estimate of a, a, of a quantitative form. If you're less, less concerned about the data, so the impact of the disclosure is going to be less, if it happens, the privacy breach is going to be less, then you can accept a, a wide, you have a wider latitude for what sort of area you're talking about. So you have to triangulate at all times. What environment are we talking about? Is this just a share into a single safe location or is it publishing on the internet? What is the disclosiveness of data as a technical object? And what's the sensitivity of that data? You're tri constantly triangulating those, those three things, okay? And to, to pick up the point that Daniel made, yes, this is still an art, not a science. I might add a short note that uh, from the statistical point of view, um, the threshold would be the probability of random match. So if you have 10 records and you publish 10 anonymized records, 
if the probability of, uh, if the risk of identification is uh, substantially greater than one over 10, then it's bad. If you have one over 10, then it's the same as the probability of a random match and then you are safe. That would be the, <laughs> the easy answer. I, I think that um, to refer to the negligible risk, I think it's a French law. Normally, it's a risk has to be nil, um, but um, I, I admit that it's not realistic to say that you, it will always be nil because you cannot estimate uh, over the long term what, what might be possible over the data set. Um, but um, so normally, I, I will say it's really like um, a tenth of a percent, uh, like a very, very a uh, small probability of identifying someone. And even then, um, you, you also could add noise so, such that you won't, wouldn't be sure that you identify the right person. So that's the kind of uh, measure that you can, you can take. We can take last question from the lady. Yes, in talking about um, absolutes, we, um, we're thinking about opinion and social market research where let's say the risk is also um, the impact on the individual. So obviously if you're doing political polls in an um, authoritarian um, uh, climate, then the risk could be quite high that somebody could be identified. Whereas if you're going to do, I don't know, attitudes to mobile versus uh, um, web, something like that, you know, the risk is actually much lower in terms of impact on an individual. Does that actually come into the calculation of risk? So I think the question is sort of what, what's going to be, well, maybe what the questions are and what's going to be done with the data. Is this basically Absolutely. What it's and the risk to the individual and the notion of harm, mm. if, if, um, if you apply the absolute rule of zero possibility of re-identification. Yeah, I think everybody agrees, even the representative of the French legislation, which does say zero risk, agrees that this is not possible. But, um, yeah, yes. Uh, I think uh, well, what I have tr tried to show that uh, is that uh, e even complete anonymization does not protect you against uh, everything, and it does not protect you against uh, the, the 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 ideological state where you are and where uh, you can be uh, in indeed uh, mi mistreated. Um, so th that's for sure. But. It is the focus of, on anonymization is again a focus on, uh, on the individual, whereas I think the biggest threats today are not uh, individualization, they are rather in uh, impersonal categorizations, from my point of view. Okay, thanks for your answers. So I think it's time to, to, to close this session. Uh, I would like to thank again all the speakers for their um, concise and uh, enlightening uh, uh, interventions and uh, and the audience for all the questions. So it's time for coffee break now, as you can hear. Thanks. <laughs>